Good morning, everybody. You braved the weather and came out. Good for you. It's, a, it's been a kind of an iffy week. We didn't know if we'd have church today or not, but here we are. And uh, so it's been so good already. I hope this hour goes as well as it has uh, previously. But uh, I want to talk to you about something today, and I, I mentioned this first hour. This is the kind of discussion I wish I could have just face-to-face, -face, you know, and we're going to do the best we can to have that sort of a feel to it. But I want to talk to you about something that I know absolutely every one of us faces, and that's temptation. The temptation has been with us a long, long time, and we talk about it sometimes, but usually it's very limited in its scope, and yet we're, we're faced with it, and the Lord has given us very specific ways of dealing with it. And I want to just introduce this real briefly, and then we'll get into the topic today. Temptation has been the issue for every human being ever born. Satan appeared in the Garden of Eden and used it to subvert God's relationship with his newly created human family. Satan's strategy was and is to customize temptation to the particular individual by appealing to their particular innate fears, desires, and impulses in such a way as to cause them to be in conflict with God. Satan is characterized in Scripture as the father of lies, the accuser of the brethren, the deceiver, the slanderer, and the God, small g, of this world, just to name a few. It's imperative that we be aware of our vulnerabilities to the deceptive strategies likely to be employed against us to interrupt our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, what we need to talk about briefly here today is there are three different arenas that temptation utilizes. The first we find over in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 where the Bible talks about that he's wanting to sanctify a spirit, soul, and body. So spirit, soul, and body are the three arenas in which the, the enemy wants to tempt us and through which God wants to use us in many ways. So his idea is to corrupt us in such a way that God can't use us and can't bless us and honor us. So listen, to, listen up just briefly. I'll give you these details and then we'll move on. The body... Here represents bodily needs and desires. Um, for many of us, we're, we're in total bondage to what our body tells us to do. The body is supposed to be the temple of the Lord. And yet so often, the body is dictating to us how we will behave, what it wants, and what it demands. And so this is a real problem. And most of the time when we talk about temptation, we're talking about sexual things or other things, greed things or what have you. But the body is, uh, is, a, is a, a venue and a, an environment where the enemy does do a lot of damage to us. Secondly is the soul. The soul it depicts the desires in the realm of our nature and emotions. This is really deep. This is, down, this is core level stuff. You know, what are the things I'm about? What are the things I desire? What are the things I believe? You know, it's a place in us uh, where a lot of decisions are made, where a lot of passion is expressed. And so this is a very, very fertile area for both God and the enemy to work. Thirdly is our spirit. Spirit is basically understood to be the intelligence or the seed of knowledge. It's, it's, it's who I really am when you boil it all down. And so these are the three areas that we have in our, in our lives, and the enemy will try and, and, and hijack those if he gets a chance. The core needs that are represented in these areas are as follows. With the body, it has to do with self-gratification. With the soul, it has more to do with the purpose that I have in my life. And thirdly, my spirit is dealing often with significance or identity. None of these things are inherently sinful. They are, in fact, noble and necessary aspects of the life God wants us to experience and to find fulfillment in. Satan, on the other hand, seeks to draw us into some kind of a perversion of them and ultimately rob us of the fulfillment that our Father has intended. You know, when we start talking about this area of temptation, what I want you to think about is what am I missing if I dial into what the temptation is? In other words, where, where am I short-circuiting what God wants to do for me? 
because God has a plan for us. He's foreordained it from the foundations of the world. And so there is a high order of opportunity that each one of us has. I don't think a lot of people think that way. I think we're just kind of on our own trying to, to make life work and trying to get through life and enjoy as much as we can along the way. But uh, that, that would be a perversion in and of itself. God has created you and me in his image. And he wants to inhabit that. He wants to flesh that out. He wants to send us out into the world with the power of God on our life to, in order to drive back darkness everywhere we find it. And when we understand that that's God's idea, and we understand how decimating that can be to the enemy's whole scheme, you can understand why he would try and come pervert that, make it selfish on your part so that you are trying to just get out of life what you can get out of life rather than becoming what you're supposed to become. And so all of this is part of the, part of the dilemma, and it's, it's a really big drama. Um, so I want to talk about the three aspects of our uh, fallen nature that the enemy wants to exploit. You find that over in 1 John 2, 15 through 18, if you're taking notes or, or whatever. By the way, these notes will be online later on. Uh, but the first is the lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh, which really speaks about physical pleasure. And this trait is defined definitively as an outlook oriented towards self. It's materialistic. It's egocentric. It's exploitative and selfish. It takes for itself what it desires irrespective of the consequences and simply concerns itself with the satisfaction of physical desires. The arena, of course, in which this happens is the body. In Genesis 3, where the first temptation takes place, we see it with Eve. She has access to every tree in the garden to eat. Food is not a problem. And God said, there's only one tree I don't want you to eat of. And in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. So if Eve's in the garden, the serpent representing Satan comes to her, some fashion or form, and begins to tempt her. And she, in response to her body, says, this looks good for food. I mean, really? You got everything in the world to eat, and you, you own it all, you're, you're, you're the gardener, and, and, and you can have anything you want, and the one thing that you're not supposed to touch, you have a passion for. That's what temptation's all about. The body had a response. Oh, that looks so good. That seems like such a small thing. But when God says no, it's a big thing. But the body won out, and it got its way. And every one of us downstream from that moment have been affected by a thing called sin, a fallen nature that left to itself will probably always respond to temptation positively in the sense of taking it. And the bottom line here is that the, the lust of the flesh is a big, big deal that we all have to deal with. And there's various forms of, of that lust. And, and, and we, we talk about it a lot of times. The, the sexual uh, topic gets most treatment. But there's all kinds of things that our flesh desires. Let me just give you an illustration. Anybody this morning wake up and say, uh, I don't want to go to church today. Anybody here ever get ready to, to, to start your day and know you ought to read the Word or pray or something? I don't really feel like it right now. How many of you know what I'm saying? Just stuff like that. And, and we, we tend to listen to our bodies and we obey our bodies because we are so into instant gratification. So this is a big deal. The second one doesn't get as much play, but I think it's probably one of the areas that we fail in the most. It's called the lust of the eyes. This speaks of mental pleasure. Now listen up on this one. This is the desire that fills the thought life with contemplation. In Bible times, it was referred to the love of beauty divorced from the love of goodness. 
That had some bearing on some of the literature of the time. But it carries a distinct sense of seeing oneself in certain situations and having certain things. It can lead to a form of covetousness. This, of course, occurs in the arena of the soul. In Genesis 3, Eve experienced it when the fruit of the, of the tree appeared as pleasant to the eyes. Here's what this may look like in our life. It happens in social cultures. It happens in all kinds of situations in, in life. Let's just say that you see someone doing what you would like to be doing, and you become jealous. You see someone driving in the, in the parking lot in, the, in a new car like you would like to have, and you become jealous or covetous. See, in the law of God, we were warned about coveting other people's stuff, coveting other people's spouse, and so on and so forth. And this all starts in the, in the realm of the soul many times because we see someone enjoying life like we would like to be enjoying life. I see a lot of this enacted in politics right now. Uh, you know, the, the class structure warfare and all the things going on. Everybody's jealous of what everybody else has got. And this is a, this is a function of a person's soul. And it's a really a dangerous thing. Because here's the, here's, the, here's the deal. Even in church, there may be musicians sitting in the, in the crowd this morning that say, I'm better than those guys. I, I, I wish I was up there doing that. I, I wish they'd sit down and let me do what I, I can do. And, and, and you wouldn't say that to anybody else, but down inside you know it's you. Or, or, or whatever your, your, your bent might be that you, that you really feel like you've got something to share or something to do or you're better than, than you're getting uh, seen to be. And, and you carry this thing and you're constantly in turmoil because the lust of the eyes. How would I fit in that location, in that situation? Does anybody ever dream of moments where you're in this position and everybody's looking at you? No, not this group, I'm sure. The, the last hour group, they were bad. <laughs> but I think maybe I might be talking to some people. I think maybe there's some of us here that, that live with jealousy from what other people are experiencing that we don't get to experience. And you know what? To the degree that we do that, we're ripping ourselves off from what God is willing to do with us. Can I just tell you, your idea of what God ought to do with you is probably not as good as what God has in mind for you. And meanwhile, while you're dealing with the, this looks pleasant to the eyes, God is saying, well, did you just look over here? Here, right here is something that really fits you. You are going to be happy. You're going to bear fruit. You're going to have the fruit of the Spirit on your life, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance, if you'll just go here. And you're hanging on, you know, like the, like the guy that, that played on the basketball team in high school and never, never got the accolades that he thought he should have gotten. And he gets into some kind of after high school league somewhere and just tears everybody up. You know, I, I remember playing with guys like that in intramural stuff and, and later on after I played ball in college. And, and a lot of these guys had never made it in high school or college. You get them on a basketball court later on, and they're ugly, they're mean, they're trying to hurt people, they're trying to make up for lost time, they're dreaming of the day when they're on the free throw line trying to make the last free throw to win the game. A lot of people, lust of the eyes. Final one is pride of life. Pride of life is a deeper one even than this one. Pride of life is a, is a moment in time when it's kind of like what, what, what you're dreaming, you're seeing. Uh, the pride of life is a sense of significance and self-importance. Everybody has something built in. Since you are born in the image of God, you have a sense of significance, and basically you're an eternal being. Life has gotten in the way because of sin. Now we all die at some point in time, unless the Lord comes back first. 
And so we're, we're, we're locked in this, this uh, three score and ten or a hundred years or whatever it might be that we get to live, and we're trying to make it all happen in that time frame. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of things that, that take longer than we thought it should take. The, uh, the pride of life, by definition, is the, this phrase refers to the pride we take in our public image. Specifically, the sense of personal importance that displaces our desire to live for the glory of God and the well-being of others. This is reflected in whatever status symbol that is most important to us and that which most significantly defines our identities. This all plays out in our spirit. In Genesis 3, Eve saw the fruit as desired to make one wise. This is... This is a big deal, and here's what I want you to see here is that God wants you to be significant. He does. He wants you to be significant, and, and you are significant to him. Your value is not set by what somebody else thinks. Your value has to do similarly with what was paid for you. And the most precious thing in the universe was shed on your behalf so that you could actualize the kingdom of God in your life and become what God intended that you would be. The bondage that most of us get into is wanting to be something else or someone else. And many people live their lives trying to project something that's not them. My big beef with social media is that people are posing as something they're not. They're all living on perpetual vacation. You know, we, we go out to eat and we can't just enjoy a meal. We've got to take pictures of it so that we can let everybody know how cool we are and how awesome our lives are. And there's pressure to be that person. We're projecting this. But we know inside, that's really not who I am. I'm telling you, there are so many posers out there. So many people trying to project this cool, this image. Spending a lot of money to do it. And down inside, they know, I'm a phony. There's something inside of us that doesn't want to be a phony. And you know what it is? It's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wants to project through you cleanly and clearly without all kind of accoutrements that we add to that. I tell you, the, the, the desire we have to project something to our friends and our family and our world out there is a, is a huge, huge pressure. Maybe it, even, maybe it even happens in worship when... We feel the pressure. We, we, want, we want to worship the Lord, but maybe we came like I did from a Baptist background, and we don't want to raise our hands, or we don't want to get too carried away, because what will people think? Can I just tell you, they're not paying any attention to you. You wouldn't worry so much about what people think if you realize how seldom they do think of you. <laughs> they're thinking about themselves. They're sitting there in the pew with you saying, I don't know if I want to remove the hand thing or, or not. I get a little bounce in my step, but I don't want to get carried. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Wouldn't it be awesome if you never worried about what everybody thinks? Do you see with me that one of the biggest tricks that the enemy would be putting constantly in your mind the fact that people are thinking, what are they doing? What are, they're thinking about you and, 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 you know, what you're projecting. They don't think about you. Get over yourself. Just be a little more vertical. When you predominantly think vertically, you won't have near as much trouble dealing with horizontally. When you know who you are in the kingdom of God, when you know who you are in God's heart, and it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks. But let me just say, that's what Jesus did, and guess what? People loved him. 
He made a bunch of them jealous. They killed him for it. But the bottom line of it is, he never had a problem worrying about what people thought. If, if my, my friend Harold Bradison used to say, if you please the one who's easiest to please, you'll never feel the pressure to please anybody else. If you please God, you please everybody that needs pleasing. An audience of one, so much better than a multitude because you'll never please them because they're too jealous to let you please them. Everybody's got these issues of trying to, you know, the Bible says those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. But what do we do constantly? We, we go to our closet and we figure, what can I wear? Well, what will everybody think about this if I wear this? You didn't know I was at your house this morning, did you? <laughs> this is a problem. God wants you to be happy in your own skin. He wants you to understand that he created you like you are, and he's got a destiny for you that really doesn't belong to anybody else. Now, we work together. We, we're part of community and family and all that, and we, and we learn from each other. We, 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 we gather from other people, but let's make sure what we're gathering is something that, that has value, not condemnation. Here's another thing. The enemy loves to use our perceptions of what everybody else is thinking, and he likes, to, he likes to poison us with that. Have you ever been in a situation where you, you just know in your heart that this, this is going on? Yeah, I don't know. I know they're, what they're thinking about this situation with me, and, I, you know, I'm worried about it, and I start adjusting to it. And you come to find out later on that wasn't going on at all. The devil was just putting a putting a block between you and that person, making you deal with fear, making you deal with rejection that wasn't even there. It's amazing how many battles we fought that never existed. God wants you to understand there is a total freedom in dealing with the, with the pride of life, the pride of life. And there's a couple of things I want to mention along the lines with that. The book of James has a pretty plain statement that we'd all be wise to remember. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So this, this language is, is powerful. It, uh, it, it's, it's, basically, it's one of my favorite topics because it talks about this in the, in the vein of hunting, fishing, and trapping got to be God. I mean, you know, and, and let's just take fishing, for instance. In fishing, you will be successful to the degree that you can find out what that fish desires, how it needs to be presented, and do it with as much stealth as you can. That's the picture we have here. I'm drawn, like, the, like a, let's just take a bass, for instance. A bass wants, uh, wants crawdads and, and shad and minnows and things of that nature. And so if I go to catch a bass, I'm not going to use a size 20 dry fly because he doesn't eat bugs much. That's not, a, it's not even an hors d'oeuvre for him. Size 20 is about, you know, less than an eighth of an inch. And that bass has no interest in that. There are temptations that you have, maybe, that don't even touch me. There's temptations I have that maybe you have no affinity for either. We all have them. And this is where the customization comes in, is that I already have these desires, and I'm dealing with an enemy that has been assaulting humanity for at least 6,000 years that we know of. He's, he's watched people deal with their temptations. He's gotten good at presenting to them what they already want and doing it in such a way they have no idea it was him. I, I could tell you stories. But the bottom line is this principle is one you need to be aware of. And 
the Lord knows your weaknesses. And somehow or other, the enemy can figure them out too. Because we're like everybody else that's gone before us. There's certain things that are winners for the, for the enemy every time he tries it. But here's the deal. Realize that you have those desires in there, and the enemy's going to try and come and present to you something that looks like a blessing to you. Looks like it's going to fulfill your desire. And boy, it's so easy to go there. It's so easy to go there. But you've got to be careful. In fact, um, one of my favorite quotes by A.T. Robertson was that we, in re- relation to this verse, it says, snared by one's own bait. The word enticed, though, is very important. Drawn away by our own desires and enticed. The enticement here is the, is the picture that we get of the fishing and the customization, as I mentioned. The captor gives the prey what they desire to lure them within reach. In effect, the desires of the prey make them vulnerable. Jesus makes a statement in chapter 3 and verse 15 that also comes into play. He's talking about earthly versus heavenly wisdom. How we look at things and how we understand things is key. What wisdom am I using? It could be if you're living in, in, in the last 20, 30 years that um, you think, well, whatever I want is right. We go by our feelings. In fact, we've so distorted that whole thing that, that we say things like this. Well, this is my truth. In other words, I have made my opinion truth. I have made my feelings truth. We're so confused today that we, somebody said the other day, well, there are 26 different sexes. Okay. I'd love to see the list. I really would love to see that list. But the Lord said, no, he had made two kinds, male and female. And I don't see, I mean, even the modern versions don't change that. You know, so the bottom line of this thing is we have our truth. We've decided what we believe is true. Based on our feelings, our desires, we're set up. The enemy's going to come and he's going to throw confusion and all the rest of it in that mix. And people make some crazy decisions. The bottom line of this thing is that this enticement is something we've got to get used to. And there's this wisdom that we need to examine. Earthly wisdom in James 3.15 is called sensual and demonic a, friend, a pastor friend of mine put it this way. He said, if you engage with the wisdom that is common, you invite demons into the mix. If we just believe what's being prospered out in the, in the marketplace today, we are opening ourselves to all kinds of destructive thinking. You say, well, pastor, what do we do? You know, we're, we're awash with the, the wisdom of our culture and, uh, you know, I just, I just want to tell you, be very, very, very careful where you get your worldview. Be very careful. Institutions of higher learning have become crazy. I mean, seriously. The stuff that's coming out of our universities these days is insane. So we have to be aware of that. We're going to have to deal with it until Jesus comes. And so we just need to be careful with that. Um, a great preacher that I, I read sometimes says it this way. He says, the tempter's great purpose is to divorce the will of man more and more from the will of God. And that's what's going on. Having given some background on the subject, let's look back at a successful encounter with temptation from the life of Jesus over in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. What we need to say here in, in setting this up is that he was led into this place of temptation. He was led out by the Spirit of God to be tempted of the devil. He fasted for 40 days and nights. He was living out in the wilderness with the wild animals. He was tired, no doubt. He was hungry. He was not some angelic figure. He was a every bit man and every bit God. And I, as we move through this, I want you to remember that. Sometimes we 
put Jesus in a place where he can't really understand what we're going through. But as you'll see, that is not the case. So temptation number one opens with a devastating temptation. The enemy says to him, if you're the son of God, implying that if you really are, you shouldn't be out here suffering. Just turn these stones to bread. This approach was dangerous on a couple of levels. The arena, of course, was his body. The lust of the flesh craves satisfaction of physical desires, as we said. And as a human being, he was very hungry. In addition, this could be tempting, very tempting, because the Romans had a practice when they would conquer a people of coming in giving bread to them to win them over and to hopefully dispel the, the hatred that was there from being conquered. And what a great white way for Jesus. I mean, he, he's, he's in a desert full of rocks. And, you know, he, he might make himself a loaf of pumpernickel bread or something, but, but he, he could make bread for everybody. And bear in mind, the most revered figure in Judaism is Moses. And Moses took the people into a wilderness where God rained bread for them. It would have been a sign. It would have been well received. And it would have been possible. What if Jesus had done that? He would have sinned. And he would not have been the Redeemer. But boy, remember what we've seen about seeing ourselves in a position you know, what would it be like for Jesus to, to do that and feed everybody? You know, one day he would. One day they brought him five loaves and two fishes. And he turned that into food for somewhere between twelve and 15,000 people. He'd get to do that one day when the father said go, but not this day. Not this day. So Jesus had to fight that off. How do you fight it off? What do you, what do, you do? In every case, you'll see that Jesus said, it is written. I want to say this in, in the plainest possible terms. You've got to be a student of the Word of God. I know there's, we fought the battle this morning in worship. We fight that battle. But if you don't know the Word of God, you don't know how to fight that battle. You don't know where you can stand. You don't know what truth really is. This is not about feeling or not about emotion. All of those things come into play, but they're peripheral to the real thing, which is the core, which is truth. What is true? If we don't know what is true, we do not know where to fight, where to stand, and how to get over ourselves. It's so important, folks. We can't displace the Word of God and the understanding of it and the hiding God's Word in our heart for any other aspect of worship or religion. It's central, it's core. Jesus didn't have to go get counseling. He said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The devil had no answer for that one. And so he tried something else. This next one, you know, it came from a different location or, or to a different location. And, you know, it was, it was definitely a powerful one. Temptation number two, the devil now brings Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. This probably occurred in his mind. And see, let me set you up on this. The Jewish people believed that a Messiah was coming. And a good portion of them believed that they would see him revealed when he stood on the pinnacle of the temple. He'd be seen in the high spot of the temple. And so the enemy comes along in this moment when Jesus is just beginning his ministry. And he, and he basically tells him this. Listen, jump off here from this pinnacle and quotes a psalm and says, the angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. He used the scripture. If the people were expecting the Messiah there, what a wonderful shortcut for him to appear there and then jump off of this high spot on the pinnacle of the temple and they'd see the angels come and rescue him and they would all fall in love with him. 
The only problem with that plan is it wasn't God's plan. It'd be a public relations coup, but he came to die, not to show off. Are you there? So be careful when your mind puts two and two together and gets six. Be very careful when, when, you, when you push aside an obvious truth of God's word to think and make yourself believe this is, this is a shortcut, this is a better way than maybe I, what God would say. Be careful. And you say, well, I would never do that, but hey, you know what? You might. You might. Just understand that, that God's word is the gold standard for every decision that you make. It's a higher order of wisdom than anything else. And, you know, the, the offer the enemy made him obviously would have been much more appealing than being crucified as a hated criminal. This is the arena of the soul, the lust of the eyes. Seduces us with mental pleasure, painting an image for us where we see ourselves in certain places or situations. Jesus responded, as I said, with his word. Finally, the last temptation that was directed toward him in this point. The devil directed the assault directly to his spirit. Here's where the pride of life drives us to show the world evidence of our personal importance and define our identity through what is most important to us. The devil knows how appeals to Jesus' core issue. He knows now to do that. He's destroying the works of the devil. That's what he came to do. And provide salvation for mankind. So the devil comes right at him right there and offers him an alternative plan. Simply this. In this private moment, Jesus, just bow to me. And I'll give you all these kingdoms. Wow. Who's to know? Just, just bow here before me. And it'll all be taken care of. That sure sounds better than what Jesus knew he had to do. He was going to be despised and rejected. The chastisement for our peace and our sins would be upon him. He'd, he'd become the sin center of the universe on the cross as the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He would be beaten beyond recognition. He'd be spat upon, mocked killed in an illegal action. He'd have to go through all of that. He would have to bear the grief and the sin of every one of us. And finally he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A whole lot better just get it out of the way right here and take care of business. Jesus, again, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt you serve. Sometimes offers are too good to be true. That was one. You know, if, uh, and the devil, by the way, left at that point. He, he, he had exhausted his array, body, soul, and spirit. Hadn't worked. He left, and the angels came and ministered to Jesus that day. But if all this talk about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life makes you uncomfortable when you see Jesus dealing with these three same vulnerabilities that you have. You need to know that he did. I've, I've speculated in my own heart, you know, what manner of things was Jesus tempted with? Not just these three. Uh, do, you, do you think he ever had lustful feelings for, for a woman? Do you think he ever wished that he had a place to lay his head when he walked through town and saw the homes of the rich and the comfort and ease that they had? Do you think that Jesus was tempted to be angry beyond this righteous indignation? Do you think Jesus ever had feelings of covetousness for this or that? Do you ever think he longed for sitting on a throne when he looked at Herod, knowing that he was worthy of a throne? I want you to think about this, because sometimes we don't realize that Jesus was a man like us. 
He, he was born of flesh. He was fully man and fully God. And I love the scripture here in Hebrews. There's several in the book of Hebrews, but the one I want you to hear right now was, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Did you, did you hear that? This temptation that you, you don't even want to admit to yourself. This earthliness that besieges us. I just want you to know, you don't have to worry whether or not Jesus understands. He was tempted in every way like we are. Wow. Therefore, I can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you are dealing with a persistent temptation or a sudden temptation or any temptation, talk to the Lord about it. While it remains in darkness, it grows bigger. When you expose it to the light, it scurries away like roaches when you turn on the, the light. So many of us don't feel like we can talk to the Lord honestly. We have to use religious language. We have to protect him from hearing things that he couldn't stand. But he already knows. He just said, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're going to find mercy, a throne of grace. You know what grace is for? It's not just to cover over sin. That's, that's part of it. But grace gives you the ability to do what you otherwise couldn't do. It's a throne of grace. So when I am beset by those temptations, I need to come to the Lord, and I need to tell him, Lord Jesus, I'm... You already know, but I'm dealing with something here I don't know if I've got the strength to handle. But, you know, I don't know if there's word on the, on the throne, but it's a throne of grace. You've come here for grace. You've come here for understanding. You've come here to get something that you must have if you're going to get past this thing. And Jesus says, yeah, I remember when I felt that way. Yeah, I, I, remember, I remember what rejection felt like, yeah. I remember what persecution was like. I, I remember what the lust of the eyes was like. I remember what the lust of the flesh was like. He had forgotten nothing, but he remembers everything for our benefit. So let's just cut the devil off at the pockets. Let's come boldly. We're being afflicted by that which has afflicted every person that's ever come through the birth canal. Or any other way. Got to got to make that caveat. But every one of us are in the same boat with our Savior. I think of Peter sometimes when everybody else was in the boat cowering and and they're all afraid and and it looked like they were going to drown out there and Jesus came walking to them on the water and Peter opens a mouth, inserts foot, says, Lord, bid me come to you. I can only imagine the rest of the guys said, Tch. you know, Peter was one of those guys, he was the corpse at every funeral and the bride at every wedding, you know, I mean, just that way. But what happened? The Lord said, come. Let me just tell you, you may think your boat is sinking, and Jesus is coming by this morning and just ask him to bid you come. Just ask him. Just ask him to help you walk on the water. Just ask him to do in your life what's not happened in any of your family's life. 
a lot of us are dealing with iniquities that have been passed down from the generations, and it's just kind of normal for us to go this way. But Jesus was bruised for those iniquities. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to repeat that. You have an option. And that option is, Lord, bid me come to you on this water, and he will do so. Would you stand?